Happy are the humble. Satisfied are those who look forward to their eternal inheritance. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Well, it sure seems like Satan is winning the culture war. We have neo-Marxism, a secular thought and belief just permeating through our school systems from the highest of educations down to our elementary schools in our country. Confidence in our political leaders, both on the left and the right. Even our elections are at an all-time low. Laws being passed across this country to end the lives of the unborn are being celebrated across the country. Twisting of gender so far that the people celebrate the mutilation of children's bodies. The invincible machine that is the sexual revolution seems to have victory after victory after victory. No matter where it goes, it's taken over the arts. The arts have fallen. If you just go on Disney Plus, Discovery Plus, HBO, or even HGTV, the sexual revolution has won. Sports has fallen. No matter what sport you look at, eventually every sport has been contaminated by Satan's corruption. Major corporations are bending the knee from Amazon to Walmart. The education system has fallen. The military has fallen. The government has fallen. Everywhere we turn, Satan seems to be always winning, advancing his kingdom over Christ's. I mean, so far as that at an award show called the Grammys, Satan seemed to be parading on stage and being celebrate, celebrated and cheered on. It seems like our only option as good Americans, let alone good Texans, is to take up our physical arms that we have, our Second Amendment rights, and take our country back. It seems like there is no hope. The only hope that we have is to take up arms ourselves and to rely on our own strength to win it back. Because we see that we seem to be losing, that there is no hope. But that's not what Jesus had in mind when he referenced Psalm 37. And so actually this morning, before we open to Matthew 5, please open to Psalm 37 with me. And this beatitude of the meek is one of the only, if not the only quotation Jesus gives of the Old Testament in the Beatitudes. I want us to read the first 11 verses together to see the picture that Jesus had in mind as he, he is speaking to a culture that Satan seems to have won completely. It wasn't a culture like our country. It wasn't a country like our country. Our country had you know, Christianity at the foundation. We had founding fathers. And that some, yes, were deists, but some were strong theists who put in the, the Christian thought throughout the, the foundation of this country. But the Roman Empire is far from Christian. I know we look back and we, we look back and kind of look back at Julius Caesar and go, wow, he's a brilliant tactician. And look at the, you know, the Roman governing system and oh, the, the Pax Romana and how peaceful it was. Do you think our culture is pagan? You have no idea what the Roman pagan culture was like. And this is the, the country that rules over Israel itself. And so as Israel is looking forward to a Messiah to break the yoke of the Roman rule, Jesus says, here's a kingdom that is coming that will break something stronger than Rome. Jesus refers to a, of a psalm that David wrote, beginning in verse 1. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like 
the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as, a, as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. As you recall David's life as he was on the run, being anointed king, being promised to be king, well, there was another king, Saul, who was out to kill him chasing him from one place to another for years. And it seems like Saul and his enemy, David's enemies, were winning. But God in his divine providence had David pen these words for us to read this morning. These words that Jesus referred to on the Sermon on the Mount. For those listeners to remember that Satan might look like he's winning, but he's not. Those who hate God seem like they're getting what they want, the, the, the comforts of life that we desire, but in the end, it will all disappear. And those who wait on the Lord and His timing are the only ones who will have peace. If we fail to remember God's grand scheme, as, as David here in Psalm 37 is remembering God's grand scheme and, and something that Jesus himself is going to refer to as we're going to read it again in Matthew 5.5, 5, if we forget that, his grand scheme of redemptive, his redemptive plan, we will never be meek, we'll never be gentle, never be humble, never be self-controlled, and never submit ourselves to the will of God. We'll, and, Instead, we'll be constantly fighting on our own strength, fighting battles we ha will have no victory in in, our, in ourselves, and in which the end result will only, you might have temporary victories in your mind, but the end result will only be pain without end, discouragement without end, loss without end, a fight that will never end if we forget the plan, the grand plan, grand plan of the Lord. As a reminder, when Jesus reads Matthew 5, 5, and if you can turn there with me as well to Matthew chapter 5 to our text this morning in verse 5, remember the audience, they're oppressed. You think our tax system is bad now? Their tax system was much worse. They had the boot of Rome on their neck. If they tried to rebel, Rome would swiftly come in and absolutely and utterly and violently destroy them. And they're hoping for a kingdom, a Messiah that would free them. And Jesus says, well, actually the ones who will inherit the world are not the ones who are strong, bold, and assertive. Actually, as we read together, Matthew 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You can write it down as the, kind of the main thrust, the main point of this morning. As knowing the eschatological plan, the end time plan of God, should motivate you and I to happily submit to the will of God. Because that's what the meek is. That's who the meek are. Excuse me. The meek are ones who think, they, or the ones that really don't really have any strength in their own. They might be physically strong or fragile. It's the ones that humbly depend fully on God and submit themselves entirely to God because only God is bringing an eternal kingdom, not, not us. Far be it from us. We'll never achieve or attain this. Only God can achieve and attain this, and He already has through Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Kingdom happiness does not come for God to match our expectations of happiness, as we've been talking about. But to us matching his expectations of what happiness, what blessedness truly means. Look at back at verse 5. Blessed, makarios, as Pastor Hayden's been preaching, this essentially just means happy. Not happy based on circumstances, but happy in a position that we are in with God. The meek are happy because why? Because they are receiving in their position as ones who have turned from their lives and submitted it to Christ, who have been born again. The meek are happy because they are receiving the real, tangible kingdom of God. They don't experience the disappointment of false dreams, of false hopes, of a kingdom made in their own image, a kingdom that God will strip out of their hands. They gave up those dreams. Say, God, my dreams are lame compared to yours. My dreams are, if I measured your kingdom and my kingdom are dumb. Your kingdom is great, even though I don't understand it right away. I understand the thing, if I achieve everything that I want in this life is nothing compared of the kingdom that you bring. So the meek match their expectations to God's. There's a pastor, and John MacArthur illuminates for us in the text. The hearers of Jesus' words right here are like every fallen person in humanity. You and I and everyone for the past Several thousand years. We're concerned about justifying our own ways. Doing it our way. Achieving it our way. Defending our own rights. And serving everything that we do, serving our own ends. The way of meekness was never the way of man. It should have been. But it was never our own way. Therefore, the true kingdom is not our kingdom if we are not meek. As he notes, the proud Pharisees wanted a miraculous kingdom. The proud Sadducees wanted a materialistic kingdom. These are the two ruling classes, the religious classes of Israel. They wanted a particular type of kingdom. But God's like, that's not the kingdom I'm bringing. That's not the kingdom I said I would bring in the Old Testament. The proud Essenes wanted a monastic kingdom. This group of people who said to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees, all y'all are wrong and we're going to be in the desert hanging out, waiting and preparing for the Lord. They were wrong, thinking it was going to be a monastic and isolated kingdom. And the proud zealots, ones who wanted to fight for their rights with violence to overthrow Rome, wanted a military kingdom. As John MacArthur says, the humble Jesus offered a meek kingdom. And you look through the rest of our study in the Gospel of Matthew and throughout all the Gospels and through even the good news of Acts, and even to this day, why do people reject Christ? Because they don't want what he has to offer. Why do people like us reject Christ? Because we don't want what he has to offer. Instead, Compass, church family, we need to conform our expectations to his in order for us to be meek. In order for us to be happy, we have to follow his expectations and his will and finding happiness in his economy. You put it down this way in point number one, find kingdom happiness in godly obedience. Obeying, following instructions is hard, especially when you look forward to something that you're, you enjoy. I know COVID brought us a... a I guess brought back a, a trend that now my wife is making an attempt at with a sourdough starter. And boy, is this alien creature called a sourdough starter, that's why I at least call it, is hard to tame. Its instructions are strict. You have to follow them to the T in order to enjoy a sourdough starter or also known as an alien in a jar. I mean, think about it. It's like this live creature that you're tending, but that's for another sermon for another time. Essentially, my wife was still letting me to know, you have to feed it for at least, you know, at least the beginning for seven days. You can't do it just for six or five or four. It has to be only for seven, and apparently not more. It has to have bubbles all the way around it. If there's no bubbles, no sourdough. I'm sorry. 
And you're, you better hope that you fed it enough that it didn't have any stinky odor. If it does, just, just throw it in the trash. But you can't leave this thing alone. Like, I'm just going to have hands off. Otherwise, it'll die. But you can't feed it too much. Otherwise, it'll eat itself and die. This, ten, you know, this little alien that you have to tend to that in order for you to enjoy this alien. I'm, making, I'm sorry for making fun of Saturday starters. It's just the way that my wife is describing it. I was cracking up. But the way that you want to enjoy the, the, the benefits of, sourdough, of a sourdough starter, you have to follow these rules strictly. Otherwise, you don't get a sourdough starter. You just get a stinky mess. If we're just going to do life on our own rules, we're not going to enjoy the kingdom of God. Rather, we're just going to enjoy our stinky kingdom. David... There's a great example throughout the Old Testament of those who are meek and David being one of them. Not perfectly. He wrote in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will. I find joy, God, to obey you. I find joy to follow your instructions. Oh my God, your law is in my heart. I treasure your rules and commandments, oh God, that I have them in my heart. Because I know, despite what my circumstances may say, they will lead me to, to, to true joy, not in my circumstances, but in you. As a reminder, remember, he, as, a, as a teenager, he was anointed to be the future king of Israel, but there was another king in the way. But, the, but David didn't say, like, I'm going to kick this king out. No, he served him and loved him. He served Saul and loved Saul, loved his son and, tried to, and served his son, married his daughter, but Saul was jealous and tried to kill him. You can write down the account of 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 24, where we see the meekness of David. Even though he had military might in this moment, he did not use it. Even though he could have been proud, saying, I am the anointed one of God, he was humble. Even though he had an opportunity to break God's law, he was obedient. And he had strength, he, he had self-control. All pointing to his meekness of being submissive to the will of God. The will of God to say to not take matters in your own hands, to never harm the Lord's anointed. David might be anointed, but not who else was anointed? Saul. Saul was the anointed king of Israel by God. And so as we see in Psalm 24, if you want to turn there, if you want to beat me, you'll see that day, as Saul is, on the, is chasing David, he went into a cave to relieve himself, to go to the bathroom. And so he's out in the, you know, in the wilderness. He sees a cave. He tells his army, hey, I'm fine. I'll go in this cave. Not knowing that David and his men are in the cave. What an opportune time to take matters in your own hands. The army is nowhere near Saul. Saul is completely vulnerable. And even David's men has said you know, in verse 4, 24, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I'll give your enemy into your hand and you should do to them as it shall seem good to you. The, the men are trying to, to appeal to God's word to David and say, look, here's your opportune, opportune moment. Take it. But David, knowing that he shouldn't, only cut the corner of Saul's robe, and actually that even convicted David's heart. It struck his heart. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, to my master Saul the Lord's anointed, to put my hand against him. That's what God's law says. God's law says, do not put your hand against the Lord's anointed. And David's like, he's the Lord's anointed. Even though the, opportunity, the circumstances might lead to me finally being king and no longer on the run, and I could maybe be happy and at peace for the first time. I'm going to be happy and at peace in the Lord's plan and timing. So David persuaded his men and they did not attack. And David in verse 17 well, in verses, uh, previous verses, shows Saul, hey, Saul, I spared your life because I love you and I love the Lord. And even Saul recognized David's meekness, his, his willingness to submit to God's law, his God's will. That's where Saul failed. That's why he had this, the kingdom stripped from him because he didn't follow God's commands. He took matters in his own hands and God took the kingdom from him. And here's opportunity for David to take the kingdom for himself and he let it go. He said, God, you said the kingdom will be mine, and I trust you. Even Saul recognized this. 
He said to David in verse 17, You are more righteous than I, David, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt, have dealt well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man's, if man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord, this is Saul, his son's still alive, his kingdom is still his. So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Even Saul, in his wickedness, when he saw the meekness and submissiveness of David to God, recognized God's plan. That's what happens when the meek are meek. Not only will they receive what is promised to them by God, but the world, watching world, hopefully, like Saul, would repent from their ways. But how do we do this? How do we, like David, be meek and find happiness in godly obedience? Well, it's not doing what the Pharisees were doing. They're using obedience as a means to find a place before God, to find a position before God, to find eternity with God. God calls us to obedience, not for us to find salvation that way, but for us to glorify Him in this way. So, you know, write this down maybe for sub point A to remember the purpose of obedience, the purpose of obedience to exalt God and for us Christians to exalt Christ. I mean, through Scripture, happy are those who obey the Lord. Psalm, in the Old Testament, Psalm 112, verse 1 Praise the Lord. Blessed, happy is the man who fears the Lord. Blessed is the man who greatly delights in his commandments. But Jesus even says it himself in Luke eleven twenty eight. Luke eleven twenty eight. He responds to someone who said, "Blessed, happy are those who hear the word of God and keep it." But it's remembering the purpose of following God's law, not for themselves, but for God. As Jesus will later reveal in Matthew chapter five, five, we want to show our good works. So why? So to give, so people can see our good works and do what? Give us a pat on the back? No. To give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Everything about our lives is about God. Everything about our lives is about exalting Jesus. That's why we obey Him. We don't treat people kindly so we can have a good business transaction. So then maybe they might, you know, give a little bit more money to us or sell something at a discounted price. We're not kind to people just to serve our own means. We're kind to people as God has commanded us to do so, as Jesus commanded us to do so, so we can exalt Christ in us for them to see. See how everything that we do in our lives changes to, instead of serving ourselves but instead to be meek and to serve the Lord and to exalt Him. And I guarantee you, if you do that more, you will find a true happiness that's almost un, that is almost unexplainable to others. It's remembering God's goal with His commands. Remembering God's goal with His commands. His, com his goal is to exalt His image through humanity. And if we follow His commands, guess what it brings? True harmony and true flourishing. I like to ask, uh, when I lead the kids' ministry, I like to ask them, like, why, why did God say, don't murder? Or, the, you know, teenagers, why, why does it say, don't commit adultery? Why do the Ten Commandments exist? Why does God's law exist in the first place? It's because His laws, ref, the laws of God reflect His character. And if we follow His laws, we reflect who God truly is, we don't take life because only God can take life because only God gives life. We don't steal because we are to find our contentment in what God gives us and trusting in God to provide what we need rather than taking matters in our own hands. We don't commit adultery against our spouse. We are faithful to our spouse. Why? Because God is faithful to us. You see how when we follow God, it's not burdensome? It's burdensome only for the unbeliever because they're trying to find, follow God's law unto salvation. They're trying to follow God's law to find position before God. 
instead of following God's laws to exalt his image for his glory to be known throughout the world. And when we do that, we find true kingdom happiness. Jesus even emphasized this in John 13, 34 to 35, when he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. If we just love one another, wouldn't that be more flourishing for this world and more harmony for this world if you know, our murder rates begin to go down and our thieving rates begin to go down and our unfaithfulness rates begin to go down with it and create a naturally a, a harmonious culture that is designed by God. So God says, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also love one another. Why? By this, all people will know that you are really nice people. No, no. That you are pretty cool. No. That people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Why do we do what we do for God? So others may see who God, others may see who God is. If you want to find kingdom happiness and obedience, be meek. And the meek want to exalt God first. Two more ways that you can find happiness. And the first is that you can find happiness knowing that God's laws is protecting you from sin's destructions. You can jot down Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. It's a great passage as a reminder of what happens when we don't, when we are not meek. When we don't submit to God's laws and rules. Jesus ends his Sermon on the Mount with this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man, a smart person who built their house on a rock with a strong foundation. A rain fell, floods came, and winds blew. Trials and afflictions and tribulations came in their lives. And what happened? It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The foundation of everything that we do is Christ. If we follow Christ as Christ calls us to, we won't fall to the trials and tribulations and afflictions that we all face, every human. However, if we don't do it, let Jesus, if you're going to be mad at someone, be mad at Jesus when he says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish person who built his house on the sand. Same rain fell, the same floods came, the same winds blew and beat on the house. Nothing's changed. Both houses are experiencing the same trials and tribulations and afflictions. Well, what's the difference? One humbly and meekly follows God and submits to him, and the other doesn't. And what happens? And the house fell. And I love it. This is how Jesus ends the sermon right here. This whole sermon on the mount right here. And great was the fall of it. Let me step on all y'all's toes as God stepped on my toes this week. Are we surprised if our life right now is messy? If we haven't been following what God has been calling us to do? If our relationships are broken right now? Our homes are not in harmony? Church, it's best that we take a mirror and look at ourselves and ask God, God, where am I not following you? Your rules and laws are good. They're not burdensome. You mentioned this. You say this. In Matthew 11, my commandments are not burdensome, but they feel burdensome. God, why? Well, maybe it's because you're trying to build your kingdom instead of being meek and submitting to his. So let's examine ourselves, church, and find true happiness, not in the kingdom that we want to create, but instead of the kingdom that God is bringing. Finally, how to have happiness and godly obedience. We understand, number four, understand that this is truly fruitful work to follow, to follow him. God's command to all Christians is to what? Make disciples. That's what we preached on about a couple months ago, right? Make disciples of Jesus Christ. That is our sole purpose as Christians. The way that we can glorify God the most in our lives is to make disciples. When we do that, we'll experience a work, no matter if we're tired or hungry or, or exhausted or sleepy, we'll find happiness, like Jesus did in John chapter 4. When he's talking to a Samaritan woman, he's evangelizing to her. He's hungry. The disciples know this. They went to go get food, and they came back, and they're like, well, first off, Jesus is talking to a girl, and she's a Samaritan woman. Jesus, what are you doing? And by the way, we brought you some food. I know you're, you know you're hungry. I know we have eaten all day. And Jesus says this in John 4. 
I'm not really hungry, really. Evan paraphrase. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus was fed by following God and submitting to God. Jesus, the most perfectly meek person. So we, like Christ, if we follow him, we'll be nourished and find true happiness if we follow him. He goes on further saying, are there not four months and then comes harvest? Look, I tell you, lift your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Don't crave after food. Instead, crave after what God is doing in redeeming the lost to be saved. For the Christian to conform himself less to the image of his old self in the world and conform himself more to the perfect image of Jesus Christ. So instead of spending every waking moment in our lives trying to build that perfect business and try to get that perfect retirement achieved to save for that perfect trip or to build, to move to that perfect place or to make or to have, to to receive or to make that perfect spouse or instead of creating the perfect house, instead let us spend and be spent to what God wants us to be spent for, to make disciples. Still excellently serving him excellently working, not for ourselves, but to God, to make, to make an excellent home, not to ourselves, but for God's reputation, and pouring ourselves out to make disciples. For me, it's talking less about my patio that I really want in my backyard and telling people how I'm going to try to reach the neighbors in my cul-de-sac. If we do this, we'll be like Paul and find true happiness even while in prison. Paul is in prison, but he tells him, like, this happened to me because Christ is proclaiming the gospel to the people holding me in prison, to my fellow prisoners, and it's encouraging my brothers to go out and preach more. Like Paul, who found his happiness in Christ, we can find our happiness in Christ if We do things his way, as a meek person should. But it's not just a one-off moment. This is something we have to persevere in. So if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, let's understand what this meekness is. Blessed are the meek, the praus, if you want to phonetically spell it, it's P-R-A-U-S, P-R-A-U-S, the meek, that word praus, Essentially, it's to be gentle, to be humble, to be patient, to be self-controlled and submissive. This Greek word is only used four times in the New Testament. You know, there is branches of this word that is used throughout the Gospels in the New Testament, but this particular Greek word is only used four times. Once in, in 1 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 4, talking about how wives, we need to be submissive to our husbands, and not adorning ourselves and our outfits in the way that we present ourselves instead, to adorn ourselves with the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of what? A paraus and gentle spirit. A gentle and quiet spirit. So paraus is gentle, which in God's sight is very precious. For those wives and for all humans who are paraus, it is beautiful in God's eyes. And actually, the two other times that this word is used in the Gospel of Matthew to describe one person, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 11, Jesus puts this on himself. For those who are weary and heavy laden, he'll give them rest to take my yoke upon you and live for me. For I am prous and lowly in heart. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And then finally in Matthew 21, verse 5, when Jesus is coming in at his triumphal entry. Matthew quotes Zechariah 9, 9. When Jesus is riding, not on a horse, but on a donkey. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, praus, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foil of of the beast of burden. Your king has come humble. 
And this, I would say that Jesus' meekness is displayed most in this text. It's not used, but it is implied. Matthew 26, 39. In the garden of Gethsemane. In a garden, like in a garden, there's a temptation that Jesus faced. Where Adam, our head of humanity, fell because he was not meek. He took matters in his own hands. He did not submit to God and his will. He took of the fruit and ate it to be God in his own right and fell. Jesus in a garden was tempted again, seeing the wrath of God to come that he will face on the cross. And what did he say? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but as you will. And Jesus, his deity and his nature of of his Godhead and his nature and his humanity were so meek, they were fully submissive to the plan of God. Jesus, knowing full well what was about to happen to him as he was going to be forsaken on the cross, experienced the wrath of God for the sins of many for the world. And And Jesus, in his full deity and his full humanity, submitted and was meek to the Father's will. And what had happened? He didn't take the kingdom that Satan offered, as we remember in Matthew 4. He received the kingdom from God the Father because he submitted his will to God. Meekness is humility, patience, and total submission to God's will over our own We need to persevere in humility like Christ did. Persevere in gentleness. Persevere in patience. Persevere in self-control. And persevere in submission to God's will. Like Christ. Just like Christ. So you can write this down for point number two. Persevere in meekness. Compass. Persevere in meekness. That was something I did not do in elementary school in class. I knew when the school day was over, when the clock struck three, I'd be set free from my burden and pain, called class, and I'd be at home enjoying playtime until I played football and then a football practice. That's a different story for another time. What I should have done was been meek, submissive to my teacher's desires, to, to learn, to quietly do my work to follow my teacher's instructions. And that actually, ironically, would have made the time of the torture of school pass by much quicker because I'm waiting for a time that is more glorious than sitting in a desk in school. The glorious time of playtime in my house, the freedom of my house. It's coming. I know it's there. It's guaranteed. I have to wait for it. If I didn't do it the way my teacher wanted me to do it. I did it my way. I talk to people in class and get in trouble. I goof off and play games and my own little imaginary games and get in trouble. I make that little mechanical pencil staple shooter thing. And for those of you who know, you know, and I get in trouble. I stare at that clock, you know, that minute hand is slowly ticking and ticking and hoping that maybe I can manipulate time and space to push it a little faster to get to three. But no matter what I did, the time didn't speed up. It actually made my time of waiting a lot harder if I just followed my teacher's desire. As Christians, we can make our time here as we wait for the future kingdom of Christ that is coming a whole lot easier if we persevere in meekness instead of trying to do things our way, to fight for our rights instead of submitting everything to God. A great Old Testament example is Abraham and his meekness patiently waited. God promised him that he would have a son named Isaac. And through Isaac, God will establish his covenant and his promise. And that through Isaac would be a great nation. And at a hundred years old, I mean, my wife and I are waiting for another child. But I don't think I could wait a hundred years. I would be dead. But Abraham waited for a hundred years to have this promised child that he promised that would come a great nation. But then in Genesis 22, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, you need to sacrifice your son as a burnt offering to me. That's lack of a better way of saying you need to kill your son in my name. And the meekness of Abraham did not fight God. 
He didn't try to hide Isaac. He didn't try to run. He didn't try to do things in his power any longer. What did he do? The next morning, he got up early and prepared his son for sacrifice. Why? Why was he willing to kill his son when this son was promised to be the one that brought the nations? Well, the the author of Hebrews reveals in Hebrews 11 that Abraham knows God's ways, that his promises will be kept. So in his humility and in his patience and his self-control and his willingness to submit to God's command, he went up that mountain to kill his son, knowing that God will still fulfill his promise. And as the Hebrews reveals, that God would even raise him from the dead. He said, God promised that a nation would come from him. So it doesn't matter if I do kill him as God commanded me, God's going to raise him from the dead. Because he promised a son, and then a son will have a great nation. So I'm going to follow God, even though it doesn't make, really make sense right now. And we, if you know the story, you know that God provided, and provided a ram, and it really pointed to Jesus. And, but the meekness of Abraham is something that we need to highlight. Despite the odd circumstances that he faced, he followed God, trusting in his promises. So how do we persevere in meekness? Well, first, we have to remember what Jesus promised. We have to remember what Jesus promised. Church, if we lose our attention on Jesus, we will never be meek. We will be in just constant pain trying to figure out life on our own way. But if we remember Jesus, specifically his promises, we can, be, we can endure in meekness. So whatever, I know a lot of your circumstances, but it's hard. You can still remain meek and submissive to the will of God despite the circumstances. Remember Jesus' promise of true life. For those who try to save their life and hold on to their life with a death grip, try to figure it out their own way, what does Jesus say? You will lose it. So Jesus is saying, let go. Whoever loses his life for my sake will actually find it. So instead of holding on to everything to do it your way, to work your way, to do relationships your way, to find romance your way, to do recreation your way, to do church your way, you will never find life. You will only find pain. However, if we stop and give up and fully surrender into the will of God and and to uh, submit ourselves to the will of God, we'll actually find life. And church, that is why it's so important that we are in God's word. As the psalmist said daily, not to achieve anything like a golden star at the end of the year to pat yourself on the back. No, because you're desperately wanting to know, God, what do you want me to do today? I have a full workload. I have a full house. I have a full basket of laundry. How do you want me to do this today? God, what do you want me to do? And help me to exalt you. You have to remember in order to persevere in meekness, you have to remember that God will bring justice. For Abraham, he knew God would bring justice, a just promise that a nation would come from this child Isaac, no other child, this child Isaac. So he followed through. It's remembering Jesus' promise that he will come back. I love how it says in Matthew 16, the son of man will come back with his angels, in the glory of his Father. And he will repay each person according to what he has done. So if someone has wronged you, church, someone has hurt someone you love, be meek, knowing that God will bring justice. And if you remember God's justice, actually instead of anger, it will turn to compassion and pity for those who think they can stand against a perfect and holy God. Be meek, by remembering the justice of God. Be meek, persevere in it, remembering that Jesus is with you, that God is with you. Matthew ends his book, God ends this book with these words, and I will be with you always, Jesus to his disciples, till the end of the age. Until I come back, I will be with you. And how is that expressed? Well, we see that revealed in John 16. That Jesus, even though he ascends into heaven, is with us. How? Because he sends the Spirit to be our comforter, to be our helper, so that we can persevere in our humility. We can persevere in our obedience and our self-control. 
No matter how busy your work week is, no matter how crazy the traffic you face on your commute, no matter how poor your marriage may be, or how disobedient and rebellious your children are, you can persevere in meekness if you remember that God is with you. And he promises to give you strength. And there's more promises, but I want to end with this promise. Jesus promised that he overcame the world. Yet if we look at the headlines, I, I hate looking at social media. I truly do. I do enjoy what you post, so keep posting happy things for me, please. But to see some of my acquaintances and old friends in life going down the road that leads to hell, it breaks my heart. When I listen to the news, or as I like to call it, The End of the World by Ben Shapiro, I just go, what is going on, God? How can people not see what they're doing is wrong? How can Ben not see and follow his true Messiah? Like, God, what's going on? If I remember that God has overcome the world, instead of sitting in anxiety, sitting in depression, and sitting in anger at what is happening to our fallen culture, I can remember, God, you said this to yourself, take heart, I have overcome the world. If we can persevere and meet in this church, if we turn to Christ, the one who's truly overcome the world, just like Paul did, Paul turned to Christ as a meek person would, fully dependent on, on God. And he persevered. Even when life was hard, when he, as he writes in 2 Corinthians 4, was afflicted in every way, he wasn't crushed. He's perplexed at what was happening, but not driven to despair. He was persecuted, but not forsaken. He was struck down, but not destroyed. Why? Because he remembers the future glory that is to come. In verse 16, I, we don't lose heart. Even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. The inner self, the meek self that is dependent on Christ and God alone. Because for this light and momentary affliction is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory to come. Paul is able to persevere not in of himself because he's focusing on the right thing, on Christ, on the, in the kingdom that Christ is bringing, which leads us back to Matthew 5. As Psalm 37, as we read earlier, was saying, don't Be burdened or jealous of the success of the world. Instead, remember, I'm coming and bringing a good kingdom. I'm bringing a, a land that you can inherit. Something, I love the, the word inherit in this Greek word. It, it means like you gain something that you didn't earn in the first place. My, the inheritance that my parents have laid for me, I didn't earn a penny of it. And Christ has an inheritance for those who would turn to him. For those who are meek. It's not just a land like the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Zealots wanted. It's not what you want. That perfect life, that perfect comfortable life that you can end well and maybe hope for the best in the next life. No, Jesus is saying, not, it's not this land that I'm giving. It's a perfect land. It's a new land. This is not something new that's in the New Testament. You can write down and read Isaiah chapter 60 to chapter 66. Isaiah 60 to 66 of a new heavens and a new earth that God is bringing. Jesus is trying to tell these listeners, those who are meek, remember, I'm bringing something better than this life. I'm bringing something better. So stay perseverant. Stay happy because the kingdom is coming. So uh, for us as a church, this is what we need to do for point number three. Yearn for Jesus' coming kingdom. Desire it. It's a desire that's beyond just, oh, desire. No, it's yearning. You're thinking about it. I grew up in Southern, uh, Southern California, Orange County specifically. I went to college in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I missed home a lot. I knew for a fact where I lived to my parents' house was exactly 806 miles away. 
And it took 12 hours of driving to get there. Normally, I could make a pit stop at my grandfather's house in Arizona, but no, I'm like, I'm pounding through these 12 hours. I'm doing it. Why? Because I yearned for home. Now, I, I didn't drive in a reckless manner. I didn't drive in a selfish manner. I didn't drive in the way that I think I'm the only person on this road. Was I perfect? Far from it. However, bear with me. I drove in such a way that made me sure I got home alive. I got home on time. I didn't want to drive too fast because I didn't want to be delayed by a police officer. So I humbled and submitted myself to the rules of the road. I wanted to get home in one piece, and so I didn't drive in such a way that was reckless so that I would hit someone and hurt someone. So I chilled out behind the steering wheel and used my blinker. I made sure I stayed awake because I didn't want to fall asleep on the road. So I did everything possible to stay awake for 12 hours of just sitting on the Interstate 40, just, just going. I didn't want to get lost so I submitted my will, and I'm like, oh, that looks like a pretty road I want to go down. I said, no, I'm submitting to Google Maps. and says, go this way. And I said, okay. Because I yearn to be home. That's what our yearning needs to be like, Compass, so that we look forward for eternal kingdom, that we would no longer do it things our way, but instead submit it to God's. That's why, even though it's funny that Moses wrote you know, the Torah, the Pentateuch, and in the Numbers, Moses wrote Numbers, he writes down in Numbers 12, now the man Moses, <laughs> me, was very meek, more than all the people who are on the face of the earth. Now that seems kind of a bit of braggadocious right there. But thankfully, yes, Moses sure penned those words, but he was guided by God himself. And God is revealing Moses was truly the most meek and humble person. Why? Because if you study his life, he didn't defend his reputation. He always defended God's. When Israel uh, abandoned God and worshipped a golden calf, Moses interceded for Israel. Why? For himself. Hey, God, there's a nation. This is kind of cool being in charge. Can I keep them, please? No. He said, God, for your reputation. So when the nations go, why did God go out there just to kill Israel? That was weird. For your reputation, God. Relent. And you'll see in the study of Moses, he followed and obeyed God. Yes, there's the one time at Meribah when he disobeyed God. But he was willing to submit to not go in the, into the land that was promised. And to submit to God's discipline. Knowing that there's a better kingdom to come. There's a promised land to come, but there's an eternal kingdom to come. So in order for us to be meek as we yearn for the coming kingdom, how do we yearn? How will we remember the eschaton? We remember the end to come. What's going to happen in the end? Well, Satan, sin, death, and every person who follows him, the enemies of God, they're going to have their end. They might, they might have the big houses. They might have the nice cars. They might have the good reputation. Doesn't matter. Revelation 20 makes it clear. For Satan, he's going to bring a whole army to come against the saints, the beloved city. And what's going to happen? God is going to rain fire down from heaven and consume them. And then he's going to take the devil who has deceived them and he's going to throw them in the lake of fire. For those who don't know, who believe that, oh, Satan's in charge of hell, you're wrong. God's in charge of hell. And he's throwing Satan right into it. And so we can yearn for a kingdom that we don't have to be tempted anymore. We don't have to have those thoughts trying to drive us away from God, to drive a wedge away in between God and us. Satan is going to be done with. So that's why we can be meek. When a coworker or a spouse or a neighbor slanders us or mocks us or harms us, we can remain weak and submissive to God knowing that Satan's going to be gone, sin's going to be gone. You know what? And if they don't repent, they're going to be gone. God, I rejoice in your justice. It's remembering that God is bringing a perfectly harmonious world. Texas may be God's country, but God is bringing a beautiful new world 
that's going to pale in comparison to the beautiful hill country of Texas, to the beaches of California, to the Mediterranean, the Pacific Islands. It's going to be beautiful and perfect. It's making sure that you have Revelation 21 and 22 in the forefront of your mind. When life is just slugging you in the face, I know you're, some of your circumstances, and it is hard. Government's against you. Families are against you. You're against you. But it's remembering there's a new heaven and a new earth, a dwelling place of God with a man. In this dwelling place, he will be with God and he will be with his people. Finally, perfection, Eden is back. He'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. I don't want to cry no more. I'm looking forward to that. Death shall be no more. I don't have to worry about people dying anymore. Neither shall be mourning. I don't have to be sorrowful anymore. No more crying. No more pain. For those former things of this fallen world are gone. How do we remain meek in this culture while it looks like it's running away from God and on a highway to hell? We remember what the kingdom is coming, that Jesus' kingdom is coming. And finally, remember that it's an exclusive kingdom for the meek, not the proud, not the assertive, not the strong, not the clever. Those who are willing to be humble, those who are willing to be submissive to God, who just to be self-controlled from their will and to God's alone. Essentially, to the born-again Christian, because you can't become a Christian and not be meek. You can't. Because the moment of salvation, the moment of being born again, is God opening your eyes to your sin, and you can no longer stand. You see who you are before a holy God. And you realize, I am running right into hell and I deserve it. And God does that. He reveals your and my sin so graphically. And he reveals his mercy and forgiveness so wonderfully. For one reason, for us to drop dead to ourselves and rise up alive in him is to repent of our lives to turn from it and all of our sin not just these little sins here and there no no it's a wholesale say I'm dumping my life and turning from it and running to you God because I know that only you could have saved me only you on the cross cover my sin only you can raise from the, from the dead because you are the only one that defeated death. God, I trust you and you alone to wipe me clean. That is the moment of meekness, the first moment of meekness for all people who are truly meek when they're meek and submit to God unto salvation. And we live this life of meekness Remembering these promises, we can again be like Paul. Looking back at the mileage that he put in in his life, tired, old, weary, and in prison, knowing that he poured himself as a drink offering and his time of departure has come, he can say with joy, and it's our, my prayer that we can say this with joy as a church because he has persevered in meekness and remembered the kingdom to come. He can say with confidence, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. I know the coming kingdom. So even though I know my head is about to be chopped off by Rome, I know that when I die, I gain life. There's a poem, I think, that encapsulates the idea of meekness so well. It's written by C.T. Studd who lived from 1860 to 1931. He was a professional cricket player. For those who don't know what cricket is, it's like baseball, but weirder. Very difficult. He was England's, one of the greatest cricket players of his time, if not the greatest cricket player of his time. Actually, he came from a very wealthy family. But he was saved at 18 years old. And for the conviction of God, it led him just to give away his inheritance, to support the mission work at the time, but also he gave up his professional career to serve the Lord 
to humble himself to say, God, it's more important for me to make disciples to hit a ball with a weird-looking bat. He served in China, India, and he's most famous for Africa. But he knew the eschatological plan of God, and it motivated him to happily, gratefully, even though by the time, at the end of his life, he was practically toothless and had new teeth, he submitted to the will of God. He found happiness and godly obedience. He persevered in meekness the rest of his life because he yearned for the coming kingdom. So I'd like to close with the words that he wrote in a three-minute poem. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life that still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave into God's holy will to cleave. Only one life to will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one will until soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to stay. Only one life till soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only let my love with fervor burn. And from the world, now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy alone. Only one life till soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I'll know I say, t'was worth it all. Only one life till soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Compass, let us persevere in meekness, knowing the coming kingdom of Christ is arriving for those who submit to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. God, it is our prayer, Lord, that we do not walk out of these doors not changed, but instead, Lord, to be meek, humble, gentle, and submissive to your will, knowing that, God, you and you alone are worth living for. So, God, help us, God, to remember that this is only one life that we have, and help us to live it in the way that you call us to do, to declare your image in us, to declare your gospel to the lost. So, God, help us to persevere in meekness despite the trials that we face. So Lord, please be with us as we sing one more song of your amazing grace. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.